Good afternoon. Hot audience. Can I have a round of applause, please? I need your energy to feed my energy. I see it's been a hard audience. So I've got notes, so don't mind me if I look at my notes. I want to take you back a little bit about what CFA means for me. How would one plot the future prospects of this little girl in the 1970s? Do you think we could use Python to plot what her future like, would look like? She has a metal brace right up to her thigh. High potential of scoliosis, no zero possibility of love, marriage, much less a career in a world where women were expected to dream of being the perfect homemaker. Yet, there is that smile. The smile of ignorance, enthusiasm, and optimism. If you are here and you think, the woman standing in front of me, I could never be there. This is, this is the girl I was. I actually haven't changed much in 50 years since then. I continue to hunger, to learn with enthusiasm. I remain optimistic that falling down, and I fall down a lot, doesn't make me a failure. I'm going to step off the edge right now. <laughs> now, we have learned how technical skills can open the doors to the world of finance. I concur. Now, we all have our plan A's in life. Um, my plan A of being a diplomat went out the window when the Malaysian government decided not to hire all of its JPA scholars in a hiring freeze. Unfortunately, um, the scholarship determined degree of philosophy, politics and economics did not really help in the job interviews for finance. It's been a long while, but I still recall the day the head of HR for an investment bank flatly told me that there would be tears of failure as I had no accounting technical skills. They were going to close the door and I said, give me a chance. Now getting my CFA without tuition help because I was flat broke in those days uh, certainly helped ensure my credibility in the world of finance. Now, for those of you who are doing your CFA, you will know getting your CFA charter requires commitment, sacrifice, and appreciation of learning beyond what you're doing for your day job. It also requires mastering soft skills, you know, or maybe not. But in life, mastering soft skills requires leadership, commitment, sacrifice, and an appreciation of beyond the day job. Getting a CFA will get you into the job. At the very minimum, it will get you their interview. What you do with it, now that's when you need soft skills. Now, the CFA Institute advocates for continuing education. I concur wholeheartedly. If you aspire, as that little girl in the photo does, an influential career, a leadership title, you need to prepare to learn the technical skills, master the soft skills, and focus on making a positive and meaningful difference. Now, Google tells us, you know, we all, we all, we all do our Google thing, right? Google tells us that leadership, leadership is the ability to influence and guide others to follow. In Malaysia particularly, it is often attributed to a person's title, seniority, or ranking in the hierarchy. We all know is boss. Yes, boss. No boss. Boss cool. Your boss. My boss. All boss. But we all know that there are good bosses and bad bosses. Now, CFA curriculum runs from ethics to financial statements to derivatives. When you think about leadership, do you really have to wait until you're the boss 
before you start thinking about leadership skills and what leadership skills are required for success. Here's a sample selection of what are considered great leadership skills. Just as we have our CFA curriculum, consider these as leadership curriculum. Make sure I get them all up. Would you agree? These are what you would expect from your leaders. You expect them to have insight, you expect them to have, to be able to communicate, to have passion, to influence, to delegate well. I agree. These are all important. But is that my message for you today? Maya Angelou, the writer, said that at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said, what you did. They will remember how you made them feel. You don't need to be a CFA charter holder to observe that the bosses themselves come with good and bad leadership skills. Nobody has all of these skills in equal measures. Elon Musk, visionary, but maybe not so high in empathy and delegation skills. Warren Buffett, great de delegative leader, positive outlook on life. Founding father of C Singapore, late Lee Kuan Yew, straight talking, but again, not renowned for his empathy skills. Tony Robbins, if you've ever seen any presentation by Tony Robbins, you'll know he brings incredible passion, energy, and enthusiasm to all of his presentations. The question is, not what kind of leader I am. The question is for you. What kind of leader are you going to be? What kind of leader do you desire to be? And what are the skills you need to master and how will you show up in life as a leader? Are you here for yourselves? Are you here for the company? Are you here for the people who work for you? If your confidence levels on, on leadership skills are not quite where you think, that's not me, I'm, I'm that little girl before. Um, let me reassure you. Leaders are not born. They are made. They're made through hard work beyond the CFA curriculum, but with continuous commitment to be better versions of themselves. Good leaders focus on the organization and its shareholders and the people who look up to us to do the right thing by them. And if there's a clash between the organization and the people, as leaders, we're expected to communicate clearly but sensitively the rationale why we have chosen the right but hard path. Life is not just about what, but also the how. And that is my message for you as potential leaders. Mastering soft skills is just as important as being technically sound. And trust me, you want to bring your A game in leadership, and now is the time to start. My ask, for those of you who, who think, I'm going to be CEO, I'm going to run my own company. When you get to that position of leadership, and you will get there, the passage of time, hard work, some measure of technical skills, and a little bit of luck will get you there. Ensure you make a positive difference. I ask you make a positive difference to your organization, your team, your family, your community. Every time the CFA asks me to come up, I always try and find a way to say yes. This is my way of giving back because getting my CFA made a difference in my life. I hope it will make a difference in your life and I want to be able to give back. I don't pretend to be the best leader there is in town, but I run a team, I run a tight ship and I like to think I leave behind a legacy of leadership which is genuine and true, and a commitment to doing the right thing. So don't follow the examples of bad leaderships. Be the best leader you can for yourself. It is an important skill. You can do it. If that little girl can do it, come on guys, we can do it.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's give her another round of applause, another well-deserved round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, Darina Yusuf, CFA Country Chief Risk Officer, Standard Chartered Bank, Malaysia, Burhad. Terima kasih, thank you very much for your words of wisdom up on stage about leadership. And now we move on, ladies and gentlemen, to the topic of teamwork and collaboration. Please help me welcome Justin Ong, CFA Executive Director of Deloitte. Up on stage, please. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. Great, great, great. How are you guys doing? Great. Um, I'm Justin Ong. I've been an active volunteer in CFA society maybe for the past 8 to 10, 10 years, right? So within the CFA community, if you want to think about inspiring female lead leader, there are only a few, few names that come to my mind, and one of them is Darina Yusuf. Can you give her a big... <laughs> and I was invited to give a speech. I was quite reluctant, right, in a, in a sense that um, I couldn't match the energy and the bar that Darina has, has raised, but I will try. I will, I will, I'll give my best as a spirit of CF, CFA. Um, Today is very important. We're going to talk about teamwork as a topic, right? Teamwork and collaboration. Before we get down to the, the gist of it, I have a burning question for everyone. Are you guys ready? Who is a superhero? Who is a favorite superhero? Sup Superman? <laughs> Spider Man? Anyone? Iron Man? Sorry? Darina, there's, there's no power, power puff girl here, right? Right, so as you're thinking about superhero, right? Superhero versus teamwork, right? I have an analogy that I just want to put forward to everyone that superhero tend to focus on himself and herself, right? Superhero will focus on his strength, the power that is carried, the bicep, the tricep, Right? So he has, he has a personal ego to manage right? in all the mo movies that you come across. On the other extreme, like, like you guys to think about, on one extreme of superhero will be teamwork. Teamwork call upon of every single one to play a different role in a team. And the role is not permanent, it can change. A teamwork call for everyone to focus on collective interest, not your personal ego, not personal agenda asking you to prioritize a collective outcome over a personal outcome, right? So like, like, like to think about, like to argue and put forward um, a hypothesis that teamwork is actually an opposite extreme of the, of the sup, sup, superhero mindset that we have been seeing. Um, I'm an outdoor person. I enjoy outdoor sport activity. Um, every now and then, I pick up new, new, new sport and activity. The latest sport I've learned is about dragon boat. How many of you have you, have you tried dragon boat? No one. Right? How do you like it? Right? Uh, for those of you new to dry dragon boat, there are few few rules here. One is the the person the person at at the front that's called drum drummer, right? And then you got the left peddler, the right pa peddler. It requires about 20 peddlers, right? Um, that's on the front seat, the middle seat, and the back seat, right? If you are as, he as heavy as me, you will then be most likely allocated to the middle seat, right? Because we need the center to be, to be stay stable, and there's a steel per person at the back, right? So one at the front, one at the back, 20 peddlers. Peddler, and you can kind of think about it, it's quite a fast and feel furious, right? Because the whole, whole game is about paddling. We want to get to destination fast, right? And you kind of think about it, I see a lot of similarity between doing well in Dragon Boat versus doing well in teamwork in any organizations that you may potentially work, work working for, right? In getting that done, in my perspective, there are three, there are three key things that we need, we need to get it right. In Dragon Boat, the, the, as equally important is in a respective team in our, our organization. The first thing is our aligned vision. Vision is our destination, right? I always use the analogy that if, if I'm leading the team, we are all, we, we depart and leave KL for Penang, everyone should, should move to Penang, 
right? Um, regardless how beautiful the his historic city Malacca is, no one is stopping by, right? Because we want everyone to get to Penang, right? In the games of Dragon Boat, the drummer play a very important role, right? You can see the face there, right? Drummer is the one who who control and leads everyone about how fast or how slow everyone should go, right? Based on the re rhythm, the synchronization, the drama will play out, right? So a lot of things you can see when a team has an aligned visions and directions, you will see a lot of energy, you will see a lot of power, you will see the team coming together in getting the mission done. So the first thing first, the directions need to be set, okay? So once the direction is set, we need a consistent pace. The analogy of Dragon Boat is quite similar to maybe a sport that's close to your heart, tug of war, right? Tug of war is about the timing of you pulling, right? So there are certain superhero may find this game difficult because you feel that you have a better chest Better buy, better buy bicep, right? You want to pull, you want to exert your energy at a different pace. And you know, for those of you who may not have played Dry Dry Dragon Boat, but you have played Tao Wall, well, you know it doesn't work. You need everyone to one or two, one, two, three, pull together because with, with, with that, you, you see the greatest strength, right? So the same logic for Tao Wall, well, you can easily apply it to Dragon Boat. Right, we need everyone to paddle the same the, at a consistent pace. Right, we need everyone to follow the same re re rhythm. We call for a very great synchronization. Right, very important. I've seen a lot of team that may not be achieving the full potential because you got team member who's paddling really really hard, and they get themselves burn out. The team member will just kind of tag along, doesn't want to do, do, do much. They seem to be a lagger in the organization. And that sort of team spirit, it just doesn't work in my personal view. Right? So with that sort of direction set, consistency, pace, agree, the next thing is to get the work done. In getting the work done, you need relentless paddling. Right? As someone as senior as Darina, we, put, we, we have some casual check. How long do you work in a day, right? Um, the casual response provided was 11 to 12 hours, right? So as someone's probably that senior, the amount of hours that's put, putting in is actually not light, right? For some of you have a, have a, have a fantasy where the higher you go up to, um, you got more people who work for, for you, hence the working hours get lesser. Is it true, Badro? <laughs> is it true, Darina? It doesn't work, right? So that fan, fan fantasy has been proven that it doesn't work, right? Because the more power that, I mean, the great, the great power comes with great responsibility. The great responsibility you, you, you pass on and delegate it down to, to you, this, this is on you to get it done because you have responsibility for the team, right? So it's about relentless pad paddling. I've seen, a, a, I've seen some team that um, there are a lot of talks about, hey, you need to find the work that you like. Okay? I'm a strong opponent to that. Right? Finding the work that you like doesn't mean that you, are, you can be good at that. I'm, as, example, I may not be good in playing musical instruments like piano. I'm damn bad at it. After giving a few rounds of trying, what will happen? You realize you suck at it. And what will happen next? You lose your motivation. Right? So finding a, finding a job or choosing a job that you feel that you like, after trying it up, and it's a job that you don't do well, you realize that your motivation, you're just going down the drain. All right? So I like, I, like, I like us to think about motivation versus discipline. If you are motivated, if you, are, if you rely on the job performance based on motivation, how would our daily productivity be looking like? Like that, no? Right. One day I wake up to be, I feel so pumped up today, I want to go to work. Then your productivity is high. One day I feel down. On Tuesday I feel down. On Wednesday, you feel pumped up again. Right? So if you rely, if you, if you want to achieve, if you want to get the most of your career, and you run your career, you debut your career based on motivation, 
and your personal liking. When I like it, in my experience, it wouldn't work, right? Because it gives a lot of inconsistency to job performance, right? So in contrast, what you actually need? You need a lot of discipline. Whether you're feeling good today, whether you're feeling bad today, you're feeling shitty today, please mind my lang lang language, you need to keep working on your goal. You need to keep paddling only with discipline. You're able to see great result, right? And when I say great discipline, when I say keep paddling, it doesn't mean that it requires, it requires big tasks, big job, right? A lot of time is about focusing on small tasks, get it through over a long run. I repeat my, myself, focusing on the baby steps, the small steps that you could potentially do, but had to have a discipline to carry through, right? A lot of us, when we go around and say that, hey, I want a six pack, I want the fittest body in the world, right? And you try to think about, hey, does it work option one if I go to gym four hours today? Or option two, if I go half an hour every single day, right? The answer is very clear, right? And you do not want to, I think one thing I strongly urge is when it comes to working hard and relentless pad paddling is do not crave for immediate outcome. The same thing in career, the same thing in every single part of your life. If you go to gym, if you work out one hour, you go home, take your shirt off, look at the mirror, what do you see? Same. Does it change? Some of, you, some of us have tried Who has tried that? After I go to gym, I work, I, I work out so much. After an hour, I look at myself in a mirror. What I change? Nothing. Why right? We all brush teeth every single day, correct or not? Morning, afternoon, no, no one brush teeth, okay. So, if you brush teeth once and you ask, you look at your teeth again, does it really help? The same thing, if you drop it, if you drop the routine, today, let's, let's stop brushing teeth today. Does it really harm? No, it doesn't, right? The result comes from the small step that we take every single day, the baby step that we take every single day to keep a certain routine going. In the long run, you will see a very sustainable, good out outcome. To, to get that done, you need discipline. You need to think about keep paddling it every single day. When you're down, even when you're down, best is when, when, you, when you're pumped up. All right? With that, I sum up my sharing for today. Um, I think at the start of the presentation, I urge everyone to move away from superhero my, my, mindset. And superhero, come on guys, they die very uh, uh, early stage, right? So don't try to be a su su superhero. Try to think about how can we build a high-performing team. In building a high-performing team, three things that you need. Number one is to have an aligned direction. Everyone should work on the same mission. Second thing is to have a consistent pace. And the third is keep paddling. With that, thank, thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Round of applause for Justin Ong, CFA Executive Director of Deloitte. And thank you so much for speaking to us on teamwork and collaboration. How many of you can relate about the superhero stories and all that? Put up your hands, please. Come on. Do you all understand what he was speaking to you about early on? Very good. Now, remember, please pay attention to the talks because Later on coming up, we're going to be having a quiz and we're going to be quizzing you on all of these topics as well. Yeah? We've got one more speaker on this uh, subject. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome up on stage right now, uh, Badrul Hisham Fauzi, CFA Group Chief Financial Officer, MMC Corporation Berhad. And he'll be talking to us on problem solving and communication. Tepatangan! Come on! Afternoon everyone. Hi. My name is Badrul and yep, I hope I look as young as that. That's been a picture that I've been using for quite a while to keep me young and to cater for the audience today. So I hope that at least before you come, at least you thought, oh, this is going to be a young guy speaking. Unfortunately, not quite. But I am glad that all of you are still here. So thank you for spending the time this afternoon with me. 
So I, I've got a very interesting topic, uh, communication and problem solving. And I do wish I looked that cool in that um, orange shirt in the office, but that's pretty much what we do in office probably every day. So maybe today I'm a bit more um, formal because that's um, the way the company dresses. Justin has a very casual um, work environment, so that's the arena. So yes, I wish I'm that cool, but most of the time I'm like this, probably couldn't pull that pose either. But that's to me, if you talk about problem solving, that's pretty much what we do, at least in my, um, in my world. And if you talk about communication, um, well, I Google it and that's the first picture that came um, on stream to me. So yes, um, if you talk about communication these days, it covers everything. Email, text, presentation, talking, phones, teams, mostly these days. So I thought I'll share a bit on my take on this. So this is not um, a theory on problem solving, on communication. It's more of my own personal take. And I think um, I always like to believe that at least it has worked, at least for me. So hopefully I can share some of those with you and hopefully you can um, get the benefit of that as well. All right, I started by saying, um, what do I really talk? And since it's about career day, so I think, um, I hope at least one of the reasons they chose me because I'm probably a bit of a rare breed among the um, CFA Malaysia community in the sense that um, I actually graduated in engineering and computing and I joined PMB as an analyst in 2003. Um, well, if you talk about how much I know about finance then, except for my own personal money, I pretty much don't know anything. So to climb up the career ladder, I did my CFA in 2009. So, so to me, nowadays, of course, if you talk about explaining what an analyst does, I, I thought I'll go on and say, if I Google analyst, you see, um, it's a, a lot of interesting picture, um, cool-looking people with computers and numbers and charts, but it's, obviously it's about analyzing things. But you'll see that it's really about working with numbers and trying to make sense of the data and the research. So I thought, yeah, that's actually kind of explain what I was doing, at least for the first eight years of my career. And I love it, I enjoy it, and I think it's one of the most widely pursued career probably for those who are doing CFA charter. So it's an interesting career. Before I actually move on to the corporates, so I joined them, this office of MMC in 2011. Time flies, it's been 12 years. I was doing strategy work since 2014. And talking about corporate ladders, yes, CFA is good, it serves different purposes, but if you want to be CFO, I did my um, chartered um, CIMA paper in 2015, and I get to where I am today in 2020. And, and if I Google CFO, obviously it's different pictures, but I like the one that with the tag CFO there most. I probably should buy one of those name tags as well. But it's different purpose. But I think to me, at least today, on CFA Malaysia Career Day, I, I still believe that both um, in my, both of my profile, CFA actually have contributed immensely. And just like what Darina and Justine were saying, CFA changed our life. It helped us a lot. And that's why we still do this on a Saturday afternoon here, um, out of not 100% not um, because of we want to, but we've got a very persistent people trying to convince us that, you know, it's a good thing, let's do this. So that's why we are here. So yes, CFA did contribute a lot to where I am today, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that the interest that I'm seeing in the crowd today. So, so it, I, I think, yes, I'll, I'll get to communication and problem solving eventually, but this is usually the problem. You give me the, the mic and the stage and all, and with some fancy big screen like this, I have a lot to talk about. And I'll, I'll start with saying that I believe that most of you, if you talk about being a CFA charter holder, hopefully you're thinking about being an analyst. And I hope, actually, this is the way I'm explaining what all these CFA 
capital market and all in, in my own simple term, at least to clear up if there is any confusion in any of you today. So it, it all started in a long time ago where businesses, firms, where they are owners and managers. They have money, they start business, they are the CEO, they are the CFO, they are the COO. So they run their business, they make money, they're happy. And that works for the longest time. But obviously, there are also households with money, which where I want to be, hopefully, one day, yep, but not there yet. And, and obviously, this is the people with the money and probably don't have anything to do, not spending their Saturday here. So they need, obviously, to get um, returns from their money. So then, they're, they're, they're all of us in the capital market, where capital goes to the businesses, and returns are given back to the household with money. So, so this is the way I look at my own career where, yes, I started here as an analyst in the capital market. I move over there, hopefully now running businesses for the owners. And like I said, I hope one day I'll be here on this side with money. So, so that's pretty much it, really. If you're talking about pursuing CFA, talking about being involved in the capital market, this is pretty much to me what it sums up. But the problem is, of course, if you talk about the capital market, obviously you've got the principal agent um, problem there, where some people have more information than others. That's why hopefully CFA comes into the picture, help to bridge that information asymmetry, where you are able to explain to the capital provider and to the businesses, to each other, become the bridge between the two. So that's how you add value. So to me, yes, hopefully, uh, everybody pursuing CFA is clear about this, and this hopefully will help you to think about your next uh, career opportunity. And it's a lot more interesting, right, with all the analysts and all. Um, so um, I've got three kids, obviously, and I've got this interesting um, infographic from LinkedIn, um, credit to Nicholas Boucher there, who prepared this, and actually I like it. Wow. Even when I first saw this, I was like, that's easy, because it, in my early days, when people ask me what I do, I always say finance, it's easier. And people say, finance, what do you do? Uh, accounts. So that kind of, you know, stopped the conversation, I, I don't have to explain. But when I saw this, I thought, oh, that's quite a cool way of explaining it. So, what does CFO do? Increase revenue, decrease cost, improve profitability. Simple, right? That's all you do. But I think, yes, I do believe that, however, doing CFA will help you in your role, even if you want to be CFOs. Talk about cash flow modeling, investment appraisal, capital allocation, fundraising. So those are all fundamental skills that you will acquire, that you will learn from doing CFA charter, and that will help you not only as analysts, but also as CFOs. And, and if you talk about really, beside my simple answer of finance and account, obviously there are a lot of things as well, cash flow management, financial planning, investor relations, those are the skills that will help a lot for you to actually grow yourself along the way. So finally, I think to me, if you talk about communication, that's why I took the last few slides explaining to you what, what do I understand about things. To me, it's about being simple and direct. So if you ask different people what is capital market, what, what does a CFO does and all, you will get many different explanations. To me, it's about being direct and simple. That's how I wanted to demonstrate the two slides earlier how I make it very clear, very simple, and hopefully something that you can understand and you can take home and you can even explain it to other people. So that's the way I've been doing it. And to me, it's not about being, about using bombastic word, about using all the technical terminologies to impress people. Because like it or not, businesses and finance and investments, these are all complicated subjects. And yes, CFA charter holders, all of you in the future, will understand it to the deepest detail. Until today, um, my wife is not a finance person. Here. So when we talk about in the household, you talk about um, mortgage and higher purchase. And the fact that 
is compounding and all. Every time we talk about interest rate, it's like, hey, um, when do we pay the monthly mortgage? How does it work? And trying to explain how mortgage work, you know, I, I'll draw a table, that's the principal, this is the interest over time, principal goes down, interest go down, and that's how you pay. Or it's like, hey, we have been paying our loan for the last 10 years. Why is it that it has, the principal hasn't gone down? So there is no simple way to explain it. And, and you know, just you know, drawing up your Excel and this is the principal, this is the interest, this is where, when you pay, this goes down and all. Nobody wants to know that. So, so in businesses as well, yes, we must know the fundamental. We must understand the fundamental. But most people are not interested to know it. They just want to know. So what is it? Tell me. What's good for me? What, what's good for the company? What's good for the team? So yes, that's our competitive advantage. I'm not saying that don't learn it. We must learn it. We must know it. But we don't have to impress people with the details, with the boring technical. Keep it simple. And, and this picture, like I said, is complicated. And mostly in the professional world today, it's about financials and investments. Yes, that's where hopefully most of us here, understanding every bit, the details, the connection, the variable, for the fundamental building block of the businesses, of the numbers. But the value add, the competitive advantage of professional is trying to get that into that, one by one, simple enough, and stop when people has enough. People don't want to know, you know, what, what does IRR of 15% mean? No, you can start with the revenue cost and all, but at the end of the day, you just need to know that they need to know enough, and that's all they are interested in. And, and that's good for us too, financial people. Then we have that our competitive advantage, right? They are not interested to know the details, that's fine, but they've got to trust us. So that's why we must be able to understand it. But to me, to me I always, yes, it's understanding the complicated detail, but keep it simple, communicate straight to the point, and it's about making sure people listen to you. So it has to be engaging, it has to be direct. And, and to me, that's all to it as far as communication is considered. I give you a simple example of. Uh, I hope this is not alien to most of you. If if you are interested in the career, so you show this revenue, net income, EBIT, EBITDA, operating cash flow, free cash flow. If you talk about problem solving, about business, about making money, to me it goes down to simple equation of revenue where you've got to sell something to make money, right? If you're not selling anything, there is no review, you're not going to make money. So what comes next? You need to know what's the cost. And when you cover the cost, you know that's your income, right? But of course, in accounting-wise, there are also operating costs where you derive EBIT, non-cash item where you derive EBITDA, and of course, you need to take care of working capital, and then you need to take out capex. Then you get your free cash flow. Free cash flow, and that's money, right? Simple. That's all you need to solve in the business world. Every business is only interested in making money. That's why they are businessmen, they are business entities, they are for-profit companies. And getting to revenue to free cash flow, making money, is complicated. I've simplified it this way for understanding, and, and that's the way I think of it. But this is everyone is different. Everybody along the value chain will have your own explanation of what is what along the way. You can argue what's EBITDA, why is it not EBIT? Why does it have to be operating cash flow? Why is it must be free cash flow? But you must know what to use in which location. So that's how you do it. So to me, that's a simple example of explaining what you can do. And if you talk about problem solving, it's even simpler for me. If you talk about problem solving in business, people are only interested to make money. That's all you need to do. If you're not making money, you're not running businesses, then you are not in the right place. So it goes down to how to make money. The solution is simple. As far as I'm concerned, ROIC, Return on Invested Capital, must be better than the weighted average of capital. And that's a very simple approach. If you can't get it right, 
I, I don't understand why. So all you need to do is sell your services, sell your product so that you get your return and make sure that return is more than your cost of capital. Then you're making money. Simple as that. So where do you get your capital? You got to worry about funding. And you do that for long, longest time possible, reinvest the money, there you go. Simple problem solving in business. Help people make money, help your bosses make money, help your shareholders make money, and there you go. You are home. And I think that's pretty much it. Thank you, everyone.